In this lesson, we're talking about idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So we're going to talk about what this condition is, some of the factors that increase the risk for getting this condition. We'll also discuss the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So idiopathic intracranial hypertension is also known as pseudotumor cerebri. This is another term for this condition. So the name idiopathic intracranial hypertension essentially tells us what this condition is. It is a neurological condition involving increased intracranial pressure, so that's the intracranial hypertension, with normal brain imaging and no known cause. That is the idiopathic part of its name. So that is what idiopathic intracranial hypertension is. We'll talk about some of the proposed causes of this condition later on in this lesson. Now, there are particular factors that increase the risk for having this condition. Some of these include being of female biological sex, especially younger or of reproductive age between the ages of 20 to 44. Tetracycline use is also another risk factor, so using tetracycline antibiotics can increase the risk for this condition. Being overweight or obese, especially if weight is 20% higher than the ideal body weight. Having vitamin A excess, so having too much vitamin A intake can increase the risk of this condition as well. And taking Danazol. This is a medication that can increase the risk of this condition. So as you notice here, I have these letters in red coloration. And I use this because this is a way to remember the risk factors. We can remember it by the mnemonic female toad. F for female and T-O-A-D. So female biological sex, especially between the ages of 20 to 44. Tetracycline use, overweight or obesity, vitamin A excess, and danazole. Now... This condition is associated with dural venous sinus stenosis. We'll discuss the dural venous sinuses later on in the lesson when we talk about some of the pathophysiological mechanisms that are proposed to cause this condition. And the annual prevalence of this condition is 0.9 out of 100,000 in the general population. So it's not a common condition, but as we will see, we can see the prevalence increasing with some of those risk factors we talked about before. So 3.5 out of 100,000 in young females and 19.3 out of 100,000 in overweight females. So especially young overweight females are at a particularly higher risk for having this condition. So let's talk about some of the proposed pathophysiological mechanisms as to why this condition occurs. We have to first talk about some brain anatomy. So we're first going to talk about the cerebral spinal fluid and the ventricles of the brain. The ventricles are these spaces in the brain that contain cerebral spinal fluid. So there are two lateral ventricles, you can see in this image here, that connect to the third ventricle, which then connects through the cerebral aqueduct to the fourth ventricle. And the fourth ventricle connects to the subarachnoid space, which is the space between the arachnoid mater and pia mater. Those are two coverings of the brain. And this is where the cerebral spinal fluid flows. It flows through the lateral ventricles, third ventricle, the cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle, and into the subarachnoid space. So that is where the cerebral spinal fluid is located. But more specifically, the lateral ventricle, the third ventricle, and the fourth ventricle contain something called the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus is simply cells that line the inside of the ventricles that produce cerebral spinal fluid. The cells of the choroid plexus are ependymal cells. This is a particular type of glial cell that produces cerebral spinal fluid. So again, the choroid plexus, those ependymal cells create cerebral spinal fluid inside the ventricles of the brain. And then the cerebral spinal fluid flows around inside the ventricles and inside the subarachnoid space and eventually gets reabsorbed by what are called arachnoid granulations inside the subarachnoid space. And that absorbed cerebral spinal fluid enters into dural venous sinuses, which are essentially big veins that eventually connect to the jugular veins. This is how the cerebral spinal fluid is recycled. So although the cause in this condition is unknown, it is idiopathic. Again, it's idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The proposed mechanisms likely have to do with the following. Either increased choroidal plexus activity leading to increased cerebral spinal fluid, which would lead to increased intracranial pressure, or issues with absorption of that cerebral spinal fluid at arachnoid granulations leading to a buildup of cerebral spinal fluid and increased intracranial pressure, or some issue with venous pressures or stenosis of blood vessels. So these are the processes that are likely to have some issue or problem in this condition. So now that we know the process by which cerebral spinal fluid is produced and reabsorbed, let's talk about some of the proposed mechanisms for the increased intracranial pressure 
in idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So there are at least a few different mechanisms that have been proposed. One of them is vascular issues. The second is hormonal abnormalities. And the third is cellular issues. So with regards to vascular causes, it has been found that transverse sinus stenosis is a common finding in idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So the transverse sinus is this sinus here, and it has been shown that there is stenosis of this transverse sinus. However, this doesn't seem to be the cause because it's more plausible that this is a secondary outcome to the increased intracranial pressure. So it's more likely that the increased intracranial pressure is pushing or leading to pressure on the transverse sinus, and it looks like it's stenotic or it's causing it to be stenotic. The second proposed mechanism as to why this condition occurs is increased aldosterone. So aldosterone is a hormone that's produced from the adrenal cortex. And it is also known that aldosterone can be elevated in polycystic ovary syndrome and obesity. So that ties in with some of the risk factors we talked about before, being female and being overweight or obese. And it's possible that this higher aldosterone leads to overactivation of aldosterone receptors in the choroid plexus. So this may lead to increased production of cerebral spinal fluid from the choroid plexus. But this doesn't seem to be a very strong theory because children with obesity do not seem to be at an increased risk for idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So it's not likely that it's just related to obesity or overweight or metabolic syndrome or any of those particular factors. The third proposed cause is cellular issues. So it has been shown that there is epithelial cell changes leading to increased cerebral spinal fluid outflow resistance. And this may be increased, this resistance, this outflow resistance may be increased by elevated levels of estrogen and or retinoic acid, which are both elevated by increased adipose tissue. And the fourth mechanism I don't have listed here that's been proposed is issues with lymphatic clearance. So there does seem to be some reduction in lymphatic clearance in idiopathic intracranial hypertension, but this is still under study and the mechanism again is not entirely clear. There again may be some connection with some of those risk factors we talked about before, but these are simply proposed mechanisms. The exact mechanism is still unknown. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The signs and symptoms are going to be due to increased intracranial pressure. So the first symptom we're going to talk about is a headache. A headache is going to be a very common symptom of this condition. Headaches can occur frontally, so they can occur at the forehead, they can occur bilaterally or retrobulbar, so in behind the eyes. They can appear like migraines in some cases, so patients may have a migraine. This can be something to note on a differential diagnosis if patients have migraines and some other symptoms we'll talk about here in a bit. We have to put idiopathic intracranial hypertension on our differential diagnosis. A key finding with these headaches is that they're worse in the morning. So when you first wake up in the morning, they are often worse and they can be exacerbated by Valsalva maneuver. So they can be worsened by anything that increases abdominal pressure. They're also associated with nausea, vomiting, neck, and back pain. And these headaches are very common. It's estimated that up to 98% of patients with idiopathic intracranial hypertension will have a headache. Tinnitus is also another very common and important finding in this condition. So tinnitus is a ringing or buzzing in the ears. It can occur either unilaterally or bilaterally, either one ear or both ears. A key characteristic of this tinnitus is that it's going to be pulsatile. So it's going to sound like a heartbeat or a whooshing sound, and it's going to be in a pulsatile manner. So it's going to sound like your heart is beating inside your ears. And this tinnitus can be exacerbated or worsened or would make it sound louder if a patient were to bend over or were to lift up their head very quickly. So any orthostatic movements can increase the severity of tinnitus. And tinnitus is, again, a very common symptom of this condition. Up to 60% of patients will have tinnitus. Vision loss is also something that can occur as well. Vision loss can be transient, so it can occur for a few seconds in duration. It can be a graying out of vision, so certain parts of your visual field can look like they're grayed out or even blackened out. It can be monocular or binocular, meaning that it can occur in one eye or both eyes, and it may become permanent if left untreated. And visual loss, especially transient visual loss, is very common as well. Up to 60 to 70% of patients will have some type of visual loss, especially transient. It comes and goes, so there can be a little bit of graying out in your visual field, and then it can come back. The visual loss can be exacerbated with orthostatic movements as well. So you can especially have some of this transient visual loss when you're bending over or standing up or sitting up very quickly. So those orthostatic movements can worsen this or exacerbate or actually elicit some of the vision loss. So again, something very important to point out as well. 
And then we can also have cranial nerve six palsy or the abducens nerve. This can lead to diplopia, which is a double vision. It can be binocular occurring in both eyes. And it's horizontal diplopia, meaning that when you look at an object, you see two of them side by side. So they're horizontal to each other. And then something else that can occur with cranial nerve six palsy is esotropia. So esotropia is where one eye turns in toward the nose. So that is something that can occur as well. Some other visual findings can include photopsy, which is these little bursts of light in your vision. Another important clinical finding in this condition is papilledema. Papilledema is going to be the characteristic hallmark finding of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. We're going to see it on fundoscopy. We'll talk about papilledema in more detail and what it looks like in the next slide when we talk about diagnosis. But again, very characteristic hallmark finding in this condition. It's going to cause a lot of these visual issues we talked about before. And it's also going to occur bilaterally. It's going to occur in both eyes. We can also see issues with reduced peripheral vision. So the peripheral vision can start to close in. We can also see some central visual issues as well. Patients' blind spot can enlarge. So those are the important signs and symptoms of this condition. And also these patients have no mental status changes. So mental status is unchanged in patients with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Now that we know the clinical features, how do clinicians diagnose this condition? The diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri is going to start with clinical suspicion. Because this condition can lead to vision loss, it's very, very important to look out for the red flags that may indicate that a patient has this condition. So if a patient comes in with a new onset migraine headache, they have pulsatile tinnitus, they have visual field changes, any graying out in their visual field or any changes or reduction in their peripheral vision, those are going to be red flags for a clinician to look out for this condition. So some important clinical examinations can be the following. Fundoscopic examination, so using fundoscopy, looking in the back of the eye, looking at the retina. So if we look at the optic disc, this is what papilledema looks like. Papilledema is going to be a swollen optic disc. We can tell that it's swollen because you can see that it looks raised compared to the rest of the retina. We can also see that the arteries around the optic disc start to get distorted. There's tortuous arteries. And then we can also see these lines that surround the optic disc as well, this kind of wrinkling look, and that is known as patent lines. So patent lines are these wrinkling around the optic disc. So that's going to be papilledema. This is again going to be the hallmark characteristic finding of this condition. It's going to occur bilaterally in both eyes, although it can occur unilaterally in very rare cases. Brain imaging is also going to be very important here. So magnetic resonance imaging or MRV, magnetic resonance venography, is going to be very important to diagnose this condition. So brain imaging is going to be a necessity. If we can't get an MRI done, we're going to have to do a CAT scan of the brain to rule out any mass effect. Some intracranial masses can cause increased intracranial pressure and cause some of the signs and symptoms we talked about before. So we have to do brain imaging to rule out any masses inside the head. With regards to idiopathic intracranial hypertension, the brain imaging is going to be normal. We're not going to see anything on brain imaging. We often next can do lumbar punctures on these patients. So the lumbar puncture can be used to assess the cerebral spinal fluid, if there's any abnormalities, if there's increases in a certain cell type, or if there's any increases in protein. And it's also going to be used to measure the opening pressure. The opening pressure is going to be high in idiopathic intracranial hypertension as it can be in other conditions that increase intracranial pressure. It can be high in meningitis, for instance. And the reason I put brain imaging prior to lumbar puncture is because we should never do lumbar puncture before brain imaging. Because if there is an intracranial mass, the lumbar puncture can change the pressure in the central nervous system and shift that intracranial mass. So we want to do brain imaging first before we do lumbar puncture. So rule out a mass, then do the lumbar puncture. Again, we're going to see an increased opening pressure on lumbar puncture in idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And we can also have a transient improvement in headache symptoms with this as well. So in doing a lumbar puncture, removing some cerebral spinal fluid, the patient can actually have an improvement of their headache symptoms from this. So it can lead to a reduction in intracranial pressure, improving symptoms. So we can see this occurring. It's again going to be transient. It's not going to be permanent. It's going to be temporary. The odd case may 
have a more long lasting improvement. But most of the time that removed cerebral spinal fluid is just going to be replaced by new cerebral spinal fluid produced from the choroid plexus. So it's only going to be transient and we're going to have to use other treatments. Once the clinician has made the diagnosis, how do they treat this condition? So some of the more conservative managements and long lasting managements of this condition are weight loss. So weight loss, especially losing at least 10% of your body weight and also having a low sodium diet can help resolve this condition or help reduce the symptoms of the condition. But those treatments are going to take time and we need to treat this more rapidly because of that vision loss. So we have to use acetazolamide. Acetazolamide is going to be the first line treatment for this condition. So acetazolamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. It actually significantly reduces the production of CSF and it can also act as a diuretic. Topiramate is also another pharmacological treatment that can be used. It's often going to be used second line. So if acetazolamide doesn't work, we can try topiramate. This is going to be a, a weaker carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and a weaker diuretic. And then loop diuretics like furosemide can also be used as well. If we're combining some of these treatments, we have to watch out for any significant reductions in potassium levels. And in refractory cases, if we have used these treatments and the patient still has vision loss, and again, the vision loss is going to be the most significant clinical feature of this condition, and it can become permanent if not treated properly, if in those cases where they've tried the pharmacological treatments and they still have reduced or decreasing vision, then we have to use other methodologies like surgery. These can include a cerebral spinal fluid shunt. So we put a shunt in, actually remove cerebral spinal fluid more consistently. And another type of surgery known as optic nerve sheath fenestration, allowing a reduction of pressure on the optic nerve to retain vision. So again, clinical suspicion is going to be very, very important with this condition because we can have vision loss from idiopathic intracranial hypertension. We want to do brain imaging first before doing a lumbar puncture to rule out any mass. We don't want to do lumbar puncture before brain imaging. Weight loss and low sodium diet is going to be important long term, but because these take long time, we have to start with pharmacological treatments like acetazolamide, topiramate, or loop diuretics. And if we've tried some of these pharmacological treatments and they don't work, or there's worsening visual loss, then we have to move on to surgery like cerebral spinal fluid shunt optic nerve sheath fenestration to help retain vision for these patients. And as a side note, bariatric surgery has also been noted to help with reducing symptoms or help resolve this condition because it helps patients lose weight. Please check my lessons on migraine headaches and cluster headaches. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.